Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is the third webinar that we've now done uh, for the public audience. And today's subject is the H1 report, which we recently published last week. And your feedback is continually grateful on the webinars, things that we can improve as well as subjects. We had some very interesting takeaways that came from the H1 report last week. And I wanted to take the opportunity to share those with you and share uh, the opportunity for anyone to have any questions uh, that we can answer specifically on the report. You can actually download the report online at our website under research. There's a free version as well as an Arabic version of the summary report. And there's a full downloadable purchasable report, which has 100 pages that I'll come on to explain later in the presentation. I will just uh, to start off with we jump into the presentation what am i going to discuss today well number one how is 2019 shaping up it's been an interesting year and um, there's a lot going on in the funding landscape but how are we comparing to the rest of the world second are there any shifts in the ecosystem and across the region that we need to be aware of that are taking place and what industries are currently hot? Finally, is there a change in the investor appetite that's happening? Are there new investors? Who are they? As well as any international investors in this space. And finally, exits. What is the landscape for exits that's happening? Again, you can ask any question during the presentation. I'll run through the presentation now. And at the end of it, if you have any, we'll be happy to ask, uh, answer those questions as we go along. So to start off with, where are we? So we focus on the Middle East and North Africa. And we've seen more deals, more investors coming into the space and investing. And what we'd like to do is just take stock as to what's going on. So there's been a clear acceleration in the activity here in the region. If you look at this chart, which we always do to present and start the development is that here you have the red, which is the amount of disclosed funding, gray, our estimated amount of undisclosed funding, and then the funding of Soup and Korean, obviously both of whom have been acquired. And when you look at this, if we were to stretch this back to about 2012 or before, you'd see a real hockey stick of activity that's been happening. And just a couple of interesting points for 2019. We already have about 60% of the number of deals for 2018 and 52% of the total amount of funding. And our view is that we're beginning to see that we're at an inflection point, if not an acceleration, in the total amount of investment here in the region, which is extremely healthy. When you strip this out and look only at H1, it's very positive to see that we've basically seen a record year in the total amount of investment in startups in the MENA region. 66% up from exactly the same time period of six months last year. And in fact, the second highest growth rate for any given year. That's extremely positive. And that's also without including Souk and Kareem, which have these outlier investments that are taking place. In fact, on this slide, we try to estimate or predict if we use the current run rate of investments and total number of deals, and we've already seen in Q3 in the months of July, a flurry of activity in terms of investment announcements and funding, that come end of year will be above the total amount of inf uh, investments to 2018, and that won't be including the 200 million in Kareem, and above in the total number of deals that are taking place uh, in the region. And our prediction is that we'll get close to, if not surpass, the $1 billion mark of investment for MENA. Now, why is this happening? So when you look at this chart, tracking quarter on quarter growth, you're seeing that really the activity picked up in Q4 of 2018. And that acceleration has continued into 2019. Many announcements were made of VC funds closing their later funds, new funds coming to the region, new government initiatives, including, for instance, 
the Alwaha Fund of Funds making uh, investments in regional VCs, all of which has contribute, contributed to an increase in investment in the landscape here. In fact, Q2 2019 saw more deal of investments in the region than any year previously. You're also seeing many companies beginning to go to Series B or Series A+. Plus. As these companies go and raise larger funding rounds, as they go and seek larger rounds of investment, that usually has a longer period to actually close, but also looking to raise funds from outside of the region, that you'll see that in Q4, Q1 2019 and Q2 2019, that there's a larger percentage of the amount of investments at Series A, which is the pink color, and Series B in late stage. This is not only healthy because you're seeing a maturity in the ecosystem, but it's also seeing newer investors coming to the region and investing in those space. While with any pyramid structure, you continue to see more startups entering the startup ecosystem and raising early stage investment rounds. So the question then becomes, what's happening across the region? Are we seeing different geographies uh, playing a new role in the ever evolving landscape of the startup ecosystem here in the region? So on this chart, we've charted a list of countries, the number of deals that were done in H1 2019 and comparing that to H1 2018. And what's interesting to note is that the UAE remains the most active ecosystem by total number of deals. And that's only natural given the hereditary um, time that it's been in the ecosystem and the government uh, effect that they've like, tried to drive in terms of entrepreneurship. But as you can see, the top three geographies, UAE, Egypt, Lebanon, are beginning to see uh, the number of deals as a percentage of previous years drop, even though their rank remains the same, and new ecosystems begin to emerge. In this particular case, in terms of number of deals, Saudi Arabia has seen an increase, as well as Tunisia, which has the new uh, Entrepreneurship Act that was brought into effect. In terms of number of deals, Egypt saw the largest fall compared to the same period in 2016. Interestingly, when you go on to look at funding, the UAE still remains the most dominant in terms of total amount of funding. In fact, 66% of all funding went to UAE-based startups. But again, we've seen a shift in terms of ranking of where this is being deployed. Egypt, notably Saudi Arabia and Jordan, saw a larger amount of funding in the same period of last year. And Lebanon saw one of the biggest drops in the total amount of funding compared to other ecosystems. When you look at the industries, the phenomenon of 2018 was that fintech became the most invested in industry uh, compared to others across the whole of the region. And when you look at the 2019 figures, that trend has continued in terms of number of deals, where fintech has accounted for 17% of all investments uh, in 2019 year to date, and up 9% and a shift for up in terms of rank compared to other industries. The more commonly invested industries of e-commerce and delivery and transport, while they remain in the top four or five, have dropped and you're beginning to see others such as food and beverage and education come to the foray as more investors are investing in that space. But when you look at the funding landscape, in this particular case, EMPG that received a $100 million investment round has somewhat skewed the results, driving up the ranking in terms of real estate. But the others such as e-commerce, delivery and transport remain the most dominant and invested in industries across the MENA region. While you're also seeing others such as food and beverage, education and healthcare, and media and entertainment increasing in terms of percentage increase year on year over H1 2018, as well as the rank on the number of industries here in the region. And this is always encouraging as you see the ecosystem mature, you're moving away from pure infrastructure plays like transport and logistics towards other more interesting or diverse uh, industries. Now, many people keep asking, who are the investors in this space? 
And we've tracked this. And this particular slide to start off with looks at who, what would the number change? So the left column is 2018 and the right column is H1 2019. So interestingly, there were 159 institutions and by institution, I mean angel group, VC, corporate, family office, PE, or any institution that made investments, um, that made investments in MENA-based startup. And yet already in H1 2019, there's been 130, the equivalent to 82% of all institutions in 2018. 47% in the whole of 2018 had never previously invested in MENA-based startups. And already in H1 2019, 49% of those 130 investment institutions had never previously invested in MENA-based startups. And that's extremely encouraging. You're seeing new investors begin to get interested, likely because of FOMO having missed out on the likes of um, uh, Souk or Kareem or other investment opportunities uh, investing in this space. And yet the total number that comes from international funding institutions at 30% remains constant. And that's encouraging. You're seeing more and more international players interested in MENA-based companies. When we start delving into this, like I said, here we've charted the number of institutions who've made investments in MENA-based companies, splitting that by international and regional investors. And here, while the, the percentage remains constant, you'll see that the absolutes are changing. And notably, you've already seen players like MSA Capital, which Walid Fazza has moved to from Wanda. You have GFC, as well as Henkel, who are new international investors participating in the MENA landscape. Now, when you dive into it, we've now decided to start separating accelerator programs who have become more and more prominent, and you're starting to see more of them develop across the whole of the landscape. You're seeing the most active ones were 500 startups with their MISC Accelerator program, Flat6 Labs, and Startup Bootcamp. But you're also seeing new ones come to the fore. MISC, uh, start, uh, MENA, MISC Innovation Hub in Saudi Arabia now has two current uh, accelerator programs with 500 startups and seed stars that's just been launched in association with Vision Ventures. SBC has launched a FinTech Accelerator program specifically, and Startup Bootcamp has one with Pride Capital. So you're seeing these new accelerator programs fill the space of early stage funding, while you're also seeing more angels come into the foray. But when you look at the investors landscape, 500 startups remains very active, and I believe we'll be launching soon a new fund, while Pride Capital is also looking uh, as one of the most active investors, especially in Egypt. While you also see the consistent names of Wanda Capital, MEVP, Faith Capital, Beyond Capital, for instance, has recently become more active in this space. And you've seen new investors, such as Anova Investments, as, as well as Abon Nayan Holdings. So across the foray, you're seeing new investors, both internationally and regionally, as well as new accelerator programs, begin to participate as you're seeing more interested in the MENA landscape. And then finally, I just want to touch upon exits. So I did a presentation on our last webinar, which was focused specifically on exits. Now, I believe that exits is very key. Scale is the name of the game. What you're seeing more and more, and I wrote, wrote and alluded to this in the uh, summary report, is that for startups to be successful, you want to see more startups scaling, not only in their jurisdiction, but regionally, if not internationally, into bigger markets. And that becomes interesting for exits. And when you look at the exit landscape, not to repeat everything I said in the last call, but you can go back all the way to 2012 and before, where you saw the notable names of um, Info, uh, Yahoo's acquisition of Maktou, Zawiya's acquisition of Thomson Reuters. But again, you're seeing this acceleration of the number of deals that are taking place at an M&A level, whereby already we've seen 15 M&A activities take place in H1 2019, approximately 85% of last year, and we expect this to be a record year, a number of M&A activities. Now, there's a number of reasons for that. I think that there's consolidation 
whereby in many industries, many smaller companies are combining to become larger entities. I think you're beginning to see maturity, whereby companies are finally getting to series A and B, where they become interesting for international investors. One phenomenon that we've seen is that a lot of Asian VCs um, have, have become interested in the Middle East, not necessarily to directly invest, as I was having a conversation with somebody recently, but encouraging their portfolio companies to start identifying companies that do something similar in the Middle East that can become an acquisition target to grow their footprint in the Middle East. And another final thing is that you're seeing corporates become very interested in innovation across the board, whether it's Majin Fatain, Nestle, Shalhou. And one way of them digitalizing or improving their digital footprint online is by making acquisitions of companies, especially as they grow into the Series A and Series B space, either by investing or acquiring to help them with their growth. But the more interesting phenomenon is that you're seeing that the actual acquisition sizes are also increasing. Now, Kareem can be somewhat of an outlier, but everyone considered Souk to be an outlier only two years ago, and that was surpassed by Kareem. Will we see many unicorns in the next couple of years? We'll have to wait and see, but you're seeing that the actual um, acquisition size has continued to increase. And this is extremely beneficial. We always have this discussion, and I, I went into depth on the last webinar as to what the benefits are. But ultimately, I won't go into all, but it's beneficial for the founders that create this PayPal mafia concept, giving back to the ecosystem, either directly by investing or separately their employees going in and creating new startups. It's a great return on investment for all of the investors, the likes of your Pico Capital that were early investors in Kareem, now getting a return on their investments, Arzan, for instance, um, STC on their investment. The LPs are beginning to see that there is light at the end of the tunnel with large exits and the potential so that you see more LPs, family offices, large institutions investing in VCs. Employees have a stamp of approval whereby they've been a part of the journey of a successfully exited company that they can go on and potentially join or start another company themselves with the experience that they have. And governments are now seeing the fruits of the reward of many of the initiatives that they're putting in place. So how can Magnet help? I want to take this opportunity to kind of highlight to everybody that Magnet is really focused on three pillars as a business. There's the data of Magnet, where we have a database. You can use it to start up source. You can actually promote to get your initiatives into the inboxes of the people that matter. And that is side of the business that continues to grow with 12,000 startups now listed on the Magnet platform and some of the most comprehensive data, twice the size of some of our international competitors. We have a research part of our business where we use all of this data to really articulate and highlight the trends that you can see in the ecosystem. Historically, we're focused on funding, but we will also look to try and do interesting topics such as industries and geography, geographical trends. And finally, the community that really differentiates us to many of our competitors by providing you an online community to stay up to date with information, up to date with trends, the ability to apply for funding, as well as a job board with some of the most active and interesting roles that come from startups from across the region. And finally, you can download our 100 page report, which really goes into everything that I've just mentioned into much more detail, a breakdown of all of the investments, trends with historical trends of the top five invested countries by number of deals and funding, as well as some of the trends that come out of that with commentary, a breakdown by industry, all of the in, in industrial tr uh, trends that are taking place, a review of all investors, not an aggregate level like I shared with you here, but broken down by stage. Which, which investors are the most active at early stage, series A, series B, and beyond? And what are the trends that you're seeing from exits? And for everybody that's joining this webinar, we'll, we're offering a 30% discount on that for anybody that wants to buy this using their credit card by Sunday the 28th. So if you're interested, just quote H1 2019 webinar to info at .com and we'll be able to give you a 30% discount. And somebody from our team, for all those that are participating, will reach out because we often get asked, will you be sharing the slides? 
We'll be sharing the slides of this presentation, as well as the YouTube clip of this, if you would like to watch it again, and the ability to email us back by Sunday to get a 30% discount. So as promised, I'll always end by asking, answering any questions that you have. So if you have any questions, we have about 10 or 15 minutes to answer those questions. The question on Qatar, is it not on, uh, on any of the rankings due to the lack of funds and investments in the country, or is it not being ranked due to the geo, no, it's not the geopolitical situation. So the way that Magnet works is that we reach out to about 180 institutions, asking them for their funding information. And when they report that information to us, we're able to include that or proprietary information that is listed on the Magnet platform. So we usually include companies like Doha Tech Angels, QSTB, QSTP, as well as uh, Q, QBIC. So actually, the top eight are usually um, the ones that are listed by number of deals and etc. So it's likely that they didn't reach the top eight, either because they didn't have uh, the number of deals or the amount of funding in that space. It seems that there is a lot of capital chasing few deals. How does this impact the market valuation? How disciplined are local entrepreneurs? I kind of disagree with you. I think that there isn't necessarily um, too much money chasing too few deals. I believe that there is a mismatch with the amount of investment and the amount of startups that are looking for investment at every stage. Now, having said that, um, I, I think that there is a challenge that there is a lot of startups definitely that are looking for, for investment, but actually there's a lack of capital. And especially when you go to series A, B, and C, hence people are trying to go outside of the region to start looking for investment opportunities. And I think that entrepreneurs are aware of this and more entrepreneurs than ever are looking outside of the region to chase that capital. Um, how is the funding ecosystem? Is it collaborative or competitive? Depending on who you speak to. So it is not uncommon to see many VCs and institutions invest collectively uh, in deals, usually because the deal size itself um, requires more than one investor to be investing in that space. Is it competitive? I think that through transparency, we have seen more collaboration than previously in the region. Is there room for more collaboration? I believe that there is. I think that there is, it, it's natural that in any ecosystem, competitiveness of VCs who are seeking to find the right deals is only part of the business that we're in, which is startup funding and venture capital investments. However, it is wrong to say that they don't collaborate together because it's easier to fulfill deals when that takes place. But also you're beginning to see new trends. SVC, Saudi Venture uh, Capital Company in Saudi Arabia, does a matching scheme that encourages people to go and raise an amount and then get that match. As I mentioned earlier, al -Waha Fund is a fund of funds that looks to invest in multiple VC funds, also encouraging uh, collaboration in that space. And I think that you're also seeing initiatives, for instance, Hub 71 in Abu Dhabi that will come online, also encouraging matching the funds. And that will further um, encourage collaboration instead of competition. How do you see health tech industry evolving with new health tech programs powered by UAP? Uh, so healthcare, I have a couple of stats that we can say, is that the amount of investment in 2017 was 31 million, in 2018 was 20 million initiatives at all levels whether it's accelerator programs or governments so for instance the dubai future accelerator program here focuses on connecting startups to government programs one of them is dubai health i believe and um, looks to unlock that now historically vcs have been investing in more traditional industries such as e-commerce such as transport and logistics but we do have success stories, the like of your Medi, your Visitas, et cetera, which again, solve for simple pain points, but using technology to create efficiency where that doesn't exist. Are we seeing exotic health tech industry solutions? Not to date, but there is the opportunity for that as, uh, as that further develops. 
So there's a quick question saying that we're a tech startup bootstrap and would like to seek funds in H2. How can you help? So Magnet has a platform. You can go to the funding page on Magnet, which I'll ask my colleague to share after this webinar as well. There you have over 50 investment firms that you are able to uh, apply to using your profile on Magnet. We incorporated a responsive rate so that you can see how responsive those VCs are on the platform. We cannot guarantee that they invest or are interested in investing in your company, but this acts as a channel for you to connect with them. And once they have connected with you, you can connect and communicate directly through the Magnet platform. Seems there's a lot of cap, oh, we answered that question. Uh, do you have an estimate of IRR achieved already by? So quick answer is no. It's something that has become very clear that we would like to track. We would like to track valuations. We're in the process of trying to crack that, even if it is to use proxies. We would like to track success stories like a Kareem to see how much of that can be a return on investments. So that's something that we will look to try and drive uh, as well. But currently, we do not uh, have numbers that we can share publicly. I believe the company is looking for investment that are heading out of the GCC. They do not approach all the investors. I announced from this channel that Cal's Fund is welcoming all deep tech startups. So there are a lot of, thank you, Inan. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives currently across the board. One of the hardest things is to keep track of them. So Magnet likes to share all initiatives that are taking place. And I think you'll see some new features come about in the next couple of months um, that will create transparency of those features. I think that there has never been more initiatives taking place across the MENA region than now um, to support startups. And, and part of the challenge is just to keep yourself up to date on what those are. But thank you, Anam, for announcing that the KAUST Fund in Saudi Arabia is welcoming, welcoming all deep tech startups. Can you share any insights around telemedicine or digital health? Um, I kind of mentioned that earlier, not off the top of my head, uh, but that's something, we have a healthcare market map that will be coming out, according to my colleague, in the next couple of weeks. You'll be able to get an overview, not just at a high level of what those are, but also within uh, the subcategories of those industries. What are the opportunities and the challenges for new accelerator programs to be launched in the region? What niches are becoming promising? I think something that we're seeing here is that there is a lot of accelerator programs. I mean, Flat6 Labs has probably up to six countries now uh, accelerated programs. A trend that we're seeing is specialization. I think where there is a lot of room for growth is, as you mentioned, niches or specialization of industries in the accelerator spaces, and even at a geographical level. So, for instance, Saver Ventures, that's in Kuwait, as an example of a food tech accelerator program that has really benefited from the experience of the large exits of Talabat, carriage, et cetera, in the food space that has helped grow intellectual capital transfer from that into an accelerator program. When you look across the whole of the region, you already know that there are certain strengths by geography. So for instance, in Bahrain, they're really focused on FinTech as one key outline um, that they would like to kind of push on. I think that in across geographies, for instance, there's opportunity for solar, for service, um, for food tech, uh, for uh, energy, et cetera. There are opportunities for specialization in the accelerator space. What do you think that the future of the Lebanese? So Lebanon has hugely benefited historically from the circular 331, but at the same time, it was a very strong learning lesson that some of the challenges that they're facing now were not thought through during the early implementation of Circular 331. I think that Lebanon has a great, I personally think that Lebanon has one of the, the few examples of a real good hub. The BDD is an excellent hub whereby when you go there, there's an energy, there's an interaction, there's an intellectual capital transfer. There are VCs all located within the same location. Now the economic situation of Lebanon and the size of the market has made it very challenging to see successful startups um, be based solely in Lebanon. Having said that, Eli Habib and Arami, and uh, that as an example is, is something to be extremely proud of, but they have looked to scale outside of Lebanon as a market. So I think that Lebanese startups need to think, 
how can they scale? And all startups, it's not just a Lebanon phenomenon. You could say the same thing about Jordan and Egypt, although Egypt has a much larger market size, Kuwait or Bahrain, or any of the smaller countries. As a starting ground, they're excellent, especially in Lebanon, to bootstrap your first MVP product. But as you look to scale, you may look to have your boiler room or your operations room based in Lebanon uh, with others looking to scale out and get HQ or scale into other jurisdictions. And what's becoming phenomenal is that if you look at Hub 71 as an example, if you're a Lebanese startup looking to scale to the UAE, you should be looking to institutions like Hub 71 to see, is that somewhere where I can get benefits to scale? Sangia is announcing multiple initiatives to support licensing for companies to scale into Saudi Arabia. If you go to Bahrain, for instance, there are huge benefits to being able to set up in Bahrain. So I think that you need to be creative in getting to your MVP and then scaling outside. What do you think about Algerian startups? To be honest, off the top of my head, I don't have too much information and data on Algeria. Um, I can definitely look into that and get back to you, but I don't want to share that now without the data and the facts. Generally, are investors interested in post-series A rounds or are they willing to take more risk with C? No, it depends on the investor. It, it's very hard to generalize and say that no investors. In fact, if you look at Bico Capital, Lambda Capital, MEVP, some of those funds, Global Ventures, those are specifically looking to uh, focus on later stage investments. Um, that the real challenge is when you get to series B and C, where the ticket sizes are becoming 15 million, 20 million plus, then many of these startups are looking to raise funds from outside of the region. But I, I think that what you're beginning to see with 136 different funding institutions investing across the landscape is that you cannot generalize and say that any start, uh, institution is only focused on uh, across the whole uh, startup cycle, but you have different institutions investing at different uh, funding stages. Could you share with us the outline of the report? I think I did that in the presentation, but if you, uh, when we send you the summary of this call, you'll get the uh, summary link as well. I think I answered that question. Abdullah is asking about Iraq startups potential. Uh, look, I was at the World Bank conference, the Mashrek conference that took place in Jordan three weeks ago. It is fascinating to see what's happening in Iraq. There are some really interesting startups growing with very little cash. There are accelerators and incubators popping up left, right, and center between Baghdad, Mosul, um, Erbil. The situation, and I'm Iraqi, I mean, when I, when I hear about the stories that are coming out of Iraq, it's fascinating. I think that there's still challenges. Operationally, how are they structured? How are they uh, created as entities? Will investors want to invest in an Iraqi entity? Very unlikely. Can that be owned by a BBI? Yes. What are the legal ramifications for becoming an investable proposition is something that Iraqi startups will need to consider when they go to fundraise. The second thing is, it's a bit like, I, I said that at the conference, it's a bit like if you go and speak to an American investor about the Middle East, the geopolitical situation makes it uh, a little bit risky and people are risk averse to invest in that space because they lump the whole of the Middle East uh, together and the geopolitics of it. That's pretty much when you speak to a mina based investor and they look at Iraq, they see challenges with investing in Iraq. I think that you need some success stories to, like Kareem being acquired by um, Uber and Souk being acquired by Amazon, to lead the way. But there are angel investors who have the risk appetite to invest in Iraq, Iraqi based uh, companies. And I think that that will be a breakaway in this uh, economy in the next couple of years. But today, Many of these startups have been um, hustling and bootstrapping alone. What are the top investment instruments? Um, the KISS note recently, after, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, 500 Startups is one of the most active investors in the MENA region. And as one of the most active investors in the MENA region, you're seeing that they are actively uh, investing using their KISS note. That KISS note has become somewhat of a standardized approach. Um, so KISS, which is a 500, and SAFE, which is the Y Combinator, have become commonly used uh, instruments for early stage investments, which I highly encourage, because from a legality perspective, they've already been checked.
I'll just answer one or two more. Yeah, so there's a lot of questions that we will share this presentation afterwards. This question of angel investors. Angel investors across the board, um, historically what you see is either they have successfully invested in companies elsewhere and they're looking to do this. Um, the second thing is people in an industry. So if you're in healthcare and you're interested in tech, you be the most important thing when you're, you're approaching angel investors is not the cash. It's the cash plus the experience that they can provide to help fuel your startup. So when you're approaching an angel investor, it's very important to see what can they bring to the table above and beyond just cash. Um, so, the, so it's always good to approach people within a specific industry. And finally, you're beginning to see people join groups such as Dubai Angel Investors and other such groups that really allow them to, to, to learn the know-how of other people. And they have a, a more formalized process for investment um, that, that will really help support uh, the, the, the startups and the angel investors in that space. So they are predominantly investing in tech startups. Why? Because that will give you the exponential return. When you're investing in a startup, it's not a charity. You're investing for a return that you otherwise wouldn't get if you were to invest in the stock market, in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, the bank, uh, real estate. And, and therefore, the way to do that is to invest in tech. And tech will give you exponential returns, assuming the company is able to scale and grow into other markets and grow into other jurisdictions that can give them the exponential growth uh, for a potential exit. So I want to keep this to the 30 minutes. We've gone a little bit over. I thank you very much. As I mentioned, there's a few questions here asking for um, the contents. You as a, as a registered member of this webinar will receive an email from my colleague. In that we will share again the free link. We will share the 30% discount uh, that we highlighted for anybody that buys the report that's registered to this webinar uh, before Sunday. Um, we will also, also share uh, a copy of this presentation that you'll be able to download on our webinar page uh, that will have a full list of the contents. If you have any feedback, please do share. If you have any comments, please send that through. If you have ideas of webinars that you would like us to host in the future, our aim is to do this monthly. We welcome that. And uh, thank you very much for joining. And uh, we hope to have you on our next one.